Good afternoon. Welcome to the regional headquarters of the University of the West Indies here in Kingston, Jamaica. I am Richard Bernal, the Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Affairs here at the University, and it is my pleasure to chair this afternoon's program. Let me acknowledge the presence of Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. I also want to acknowledge the presence of faculty, staff, students, press, ladies and gentlemen, once again, warm welcome to the regional headquarters. This afternoon's Vice Chancellor's Forum is to demystify the coronavirus, which is being much discussed globally as well as within the region. As I'm sure all of you know, but I will remind you that the University of the West Indies is always in the role of support and making available its expertise and policy research to the governments and people of the region on all important issues since we were established in 1948. Of course, our first faculty was the medical faculty and today's issue is a public health issue. This afternoon's program, we are going to begin with an opening presentation by Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, after which we will be followed by a panel of experts. I'm not going to read their very extensive uh, bios for you. You'll have to trust us that we have assembled the best expertise in the region. These include Professor Christine Carrington, Molecular Genetics Professor and Virology Expert based at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus. She'll be followed by Professor Clive Landis, who you will recall chaired very successfully the Zika Task Force in which the University of the West Indies had a role not only in initiating the task force but in managing the task force. He's our Pro Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Studies based at the Cave Hill campus. We have a late substitution. We should have had, and he may yet appear, Professor John Lindo, but we have a most able and highly qualified person who has agreed to come in at the last minute. That person is Dr. Sandra Jackson from the Department of Microbiology. She's a medical microbiologist and lecturer and consultant and virologist. She has just recently returned from several years of working in international organizations on public health issues. So we're very happy that she has been able to join us. Then there will be Dr. Joy St. John, Executive Director of the Caribbean Public Health Agency. Um, and finally, we will have a presentation by the Chief Medical Officer in the government of Trinidad and Tobago, and he is Dr. Paras Ram. Without further delay, I'm going to ask the Vice Chancellor to make his opening remarks. Thank you very much, Professor Bernal. Greetings, everyone. Once again, Humanity is challenged in the area of public health. There is, at this time, a challenge facing citizens on the global scale, families, institutions, and, and nations. 
All of these groups are no doubt in search and in need of, of comfort and critically in need for solutions. This forum by the University of the West Indies is intended to open a dialogue across the Caribbean and to participate in the conversations that are hemispheric and that are, are global. What we do know is that the more we know, the better we will be able to cope with this global challenge. Our university has accumulated over the decades considerable expertise in the challenges that are facing us all. We are, of course, a community of experts in the area of virology. And we do know that the critical part of moving forward is in the area of effective planning, operational and strategic planning at the national levels, uh, regional and global levels. The UWI is comforted in the fact that it has established this expertise to guide not only the institution, but the region, uh, citizens, families, and to participate in the global search for solutions. Of course, this goes beyond the area of biology, biochemistry, medicine. It also concerns generally the behavioral sciences as we are effectively dealing with, with human beings uh, who uh, has historically exhibited patterns of behavior when confronted with such challenges. The university itself has been working closely with our regional governments, but I should add that it has also a specific concern, which is the safety and security of the students of this university who are currently uh, in, in China. And the planning of which I speak relates also to the university's effort dealing with parents, with our students, our staff, and of course, our host institution in China, the Global Institute for Software Technology, we too are in touch with them and concern uh, for their students and their, and their leadership. So uh, specifically, this is a, a broader family concern for the institution as well. I'm pleased that the region has started to coordinate its efforts in a scientific way. I wish to congratulate Minister Tufton, Minister of Health Jamaica, uh, for his interventions uh, yesterday in which he spoke strategically about how the government of Jamaica is dealing with this concern and his views have been echoed across, across the, the Caribbean. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing the, the commentary and the analysis of the expert panel that we'll be presenting very shortly. It is, it is a difficult time indeed, and we expect, and our university has come to expect, these very specific scientific commentaries and interventions from our academic colleagues working in conjunction with CARICOM public health uh, facilitators 
all of our national ministries of health and in the region and and finally our students themselves not only our students uh, in china but also the thousands of other caribbean students in china uh, the thousands of CARICOM citizens in China who are seeking to make the best of the situation as they are resident. So, colleagues, on behalf of the University of the West Indies, I welcome each and every one of you to this conversation, and we, we urge your effective participation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. We're now going to be joined by Zoom by Professor Christine Carrington. Good afternoon, and thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to present. Um, I'm going to speak about the virus that is at the heart of the concern that is currently sweeping the globe and give you a bit of a background on the epidemic, update you on what the current situation is. And then I'll spend most of my time explaining what we know about the coronavirus family, um, the coronavirus family of viruses to which this new virus belongs, and what we know about the 2019, 2019 novel coronavirus, also which I'll refer to as 2019-NCOV on, on occasion. So this all began in mid-December of 2019. Um, when Chinese authorities documented an outbreak of severe respiratory illness that was associated with, um, admission, with um, admissions to hospital and um, disease that, in, that um, illness that required intensive care and also it, it was associated with high mortality. They noted that the syndrome was very similar to an illness caused by the severe acute respiratory syndrome virus coronavirus known as the SARS coronavirus, which some of you would have heard of. Um, now the SARS coronavirus is a virus um, that emerged in China in about 2002, 2003, and it spread around the world. And um, at the end of the epidemic, there were um, about 8,000 confirmed infections and about 800 deaths in 17 countries. So this virus that has emerged in Wuhan, China in about mid-December 2019, um, was very quickly identified by Chinese scientists as being a novel coronavirus. And it's referred to, as I said before, as the 2019 novel coronavirus. And it belongs to the same group of coronaviruses as the SARS virus. And since emerging in Wuhan in China, it has now spread to other parts of, of China and to other countries. Now, according to the World Health Organization's latest situation report, as of about January, as, as of January 20, um, Jan, the 29th of January 2020, which would have been yesterday, the virus has now been reported in 15 countries. Now, the vast majority of the cases are in China, where they have been con they have confirmed 5,997 cases, of which about uh, they have 1,239 severe cases, and they've also reported 132 deaths. Um, there are also in China about just over 9,000 suspected cases. Now, these would be individuals who are suspected of being infected with the 2019 um, novel coronavirus because of their symptoms and or their travel history or their history of exposure to infected people. But these cases would not have been confirmed by laboratory testing. Now, it's important to understand that all of these numbers refer to reported cases. And especially in China, there are likely to be many other cases that are mild and that have gone undetected because they're so mild, they don't come to hospitals. And this is important to take into consideration when it comes to estimating how deadly this virus, um, the virus's disease is. Now, at the beginning of the outbreak, the cases that were um, going to come to the attention of public health authorities will, of any outbreak will always be the more severe cases. So remember when you hear reports of case fatality rates, which refer to the percentage of reported cases that have died, this is not the same as the percentage of infected people that have died. So you should pay attention to that. So what does a case of um, 2019 novel coronavirus infection look like? So, so far um, from the confirmed cases of the virus, um, infection, 
the reported illnesses have ranged from people who are very mildly sick to people who are very, very severely ill, and can also there have also been cases as, of deaths as we've seen. The symptoms typically include fever, cough, and softness, um, shortness of breath, and the WHO estimates that the symptoms of the virus may appear in as few as two days or as many as 10 days after first exposure. This estimate, however, is based on what is known about similar respiratory viruses. Now, um, The Lancet just recently published a paper by um, some Chinese researchers who described the clinical features of the first 41 laboratory confirmed cases um, that they got in China. And they found that of these 41 people, all of them had pneumonia. About a third had developed acute respiratory distress syndrome requiring intensive care. Um, five had um, acute cardiac injury, four required ventilation, and six of them died. Now, the authors have cautioned against using these data to make conclusions about the risk of death since, as I explained at the beginning of the, epi of the, of the epidemic, there would have been a high bias towards detecting severe cases. Um, so in this case, we see six out of 41 cases, that's 15%, so the death rate here is 15%. But if we go back to the global data that we had before, um, we have 132 deaths out of 665, which is about 2%. So we have to be very cautious. To date, there is not enough knowledge about the, um, there's not enough knowledge about the epidemiology of this virus to draw definitive conclu conclusions about the full clinical features of the disease, the intensity of human to human transmission, or the original source of the outbreak. However, um, scientists are working at an unprecedented rate and the whole puzzle is being very quickly put together and I have no doubt that very soon we will have a, a, more, a fuller picture of what is going on. In the meantime, what we do know about the virus, what do we know about the virus itself? So I'll start with a very simple question to get us rolling. Um, what is a virus? So people take it for granted that they know what a virus is and then they tell you that they're going to take an antibiotic for the virus, which is not going to work because it's not a bacterium. So you take um, so, so what is a virus? So viruses are basically um, small infectious agents that replicate only inside of the living cells. So they have to be in, an, in the cell of an organism. And they affect all different life forms. They infect animals, plants, microorganisms. And there are many, many, many different types of viruses. And some of these are associated with disease. For example, all of the viruses that I've shown here on, on, on the right are associated with diseases in, in humans, except for the one called the bacteriophage, which, you can, as, you, as the name says, it, it infects bacteria. So all of those are human viruses that we're familiar with. Other examples of viruses that we're familiar with in our region would be dengue, chikungunya, and for Zika viruses. Um, now, viruses vary in the way that they're transmitted from one person to another. And some required, so for example, some might require direct contact with an infected person. Others are spread through eating contaminated food or via um, contact with droplets or residue from droplets created, for example, when somebody sneezes or when they cough. So now we know what a virus is. The next question is what are coronaviruses? Now don't let this um, slide um, put you off. It's a little busy, but I'll walk you through. Um, so there are many members the, 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 of this family. So the coronavirus is a large, diverse family of respiratory viruses. The whole family is known as the coronaviridae. Um, now, I mentioned respiratory viruses. By respiratory virus, I mean that they infect the nose and the lungs, causing a wide spectrum of diseases, of, of illnesses ranging from mild colds or severe, and all the way down to severe pneumonia. Um, the coronavirus family is divided into alpha, beta, delta, and gamma coronaviruses. And this show, table shows examples of each. And as I said, don't get carried away with the long names shown there. What I want to do is to just, I want you to take note of the range of different animals in which these coronaviruses are found. Um, so if you look at the names, you'll see murine, meaning mouse, or you'll see human or bat. And at the bottom, around the edges of this um, slide, I've shown pictures of all the different types of animals that are mentioned and you can see that it's very diverse. Um, now I've highlighted some of the viruses in blue and red. Those are the ones that infect humans. 
and they are all associated with respiratory illness. But the four that are in blue are very common viruses. They circulate all the time, and they're mostly, um, they mostly cause mild disease, such as colds and, and influenza-like illness. In fact, about 5 to 12% of all influenza-like illness is thought to be caused by these seasonal, they're known as seasonal coronaviruses. Those that are highlighted in bold red, the ones down here, are associated with outbreaks, and they include uh, outbreaks that include significant numbers of severe cases and deaths. Um, I mentioned SARS coronavirus before. Um, this one here is the um, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, or MERS. It's less familiar to most people, but it has resulted in fatalities comparable to SARS. Um, now, the transmission, the way that MERS is transmitted is very different from how SARS is transmitted, and has, that has led it to be, um, the outbreaks to be different. The outbreaks are more self-limiting, and they've so far been restricted to the Arabian Peninsula. We'll come back to those in a while. And then we have the seventh coronavirus, human coronavirus, um, the 2019 novel coronavirus. Some people refer to it as a Wuhan coronavirus. Um, so here we have three new coronaviruses, and these have all, the, all emerged over the last 17 years. And one of the most frequently asked questions, and also a launching point for conspiracy theorists, is where do these viruses come from? Now, to answer that question, um, you have to first understand that viruses and all living things acquire mutations over time. They all mutate. Every time genetic material in an organism, the DNA or the RNA, replicates um, to make more cells or more virus or more bacteria or more humans, um, the errors, um, errors are made in the sequence of the genetic material, and these errors are called mutations. Now, species evolve as these mutations are passed from one generation to the next, and viruses, and especially those that use RNA instead of DNA as the genetic material, in general, they have high mutation rates, and so they evolve very rapidly. Um, most important thing to note, most mutations that occur have no effect or they actually damage the virus and make it less infective. But occasionally you get mutations that, for example, may enable a virus to infect a, a different cell type or a different organism, a different species. So the result of that can be that the virus, which was adapted to replicate in one species, um, can now infect and replicate in a different species. And this is referred to as cross-species transmission, when you ever get a virus moving from one species to another. If this transmission is from animals to humans, it's referred to as zoonotic transmission. So let's look at where the new human coronavirus came from. That's the question we want to ask. Um, we don't yet have an answer for that, but we can look at the related viruses. Um, so let's look at the SARS coronavirus. So the cor coronaviruses, I should say, um, they are RNA viruses, and they're very well known for their ability to jump between different species. So both SARS coronavirus and the MERS coronavirus are examples of coronaviruses that recently jumped from animals to human population. Now, the keen eyed amongst you, when I showed you that um, slide before with the list of um, coronaviruses, you would have seen bat repeated several times. Um, this is because bats harbor the greatest diversity of coronaviruses, and I just thought that all coronaviruses originally came from bats. Um, so SARS now is believed to have um, emerged from a bat called a horseshoe bat. It moved from that in about 2002. There was a cross-species transmission into palm um, civet cats and other animals in the live markets in China. And then from there, um, it moved into the human population. And this, 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 um, this type of jump, it was a rare jump, but it occurred. And that would be the zoonotic transmission. Um, once it was in the human population, it could then spread from, hu um, it then acquired the ability to spread from human to human, um, out, in the, out in the public or within a hospital setting. Um, MERS now is a little different. MERS is thought to have emerged from bats, crossed from bats into camels more than about 30 years ago. And then you got um, transmission from the camel populations into humans in the Arabia, within the Arabian Peninsula where there are lots of camels. 
Um, and then the, the, the thing about the MERS coronavirus now, it moves, often jumps from the camels into humans, but it doesn't very often go from human to human. It can, but it doesn't often do that. So the MERS spread was more restricted um, to the Arabian Peninsula where the camels were. So what about our virus, new virus now, the novel 2019 novel coronavirus? As I said, the origin of this virus is still unclear. However, analysis of the virus's genetic material, which is illustrated here by this sort of family tree of viruses, indicates, this is, this is a, well, uh, one of the um, novel coronaviruses here, and it, it, you can see that it's closely related to other bat viruses, and you can see SARS is also nearby. So it is likely, given the relationship, it is likely that like SARS, it originated in bats, but this remains to be confirmed. Um, what we also do not know is whether it came from bats and went directly from bats to humans, if it went from bats into um, animals in the live market, a specific type of animal or several animals in the types of animal in the live market, and then to humans, or if there's some other um, reservoir out there that we don't know about, animal reservoir that we don't know about. Now, there was one report um, that spread quite widely about suggesting that snakes were an intermediary, that this virus had gone from bats to snakes to humans. But in fact, there's no convincing evidence that snakes are an inter intermediate, intermediary. Um, okay, so whatever the origin, based on the analysis of the virus's genetic material, it is estimated that all the viruses that are currently circulating in, the, in humans, the novel coronaviruses circulating in humans, descended from a single introduction into the human population, or if it wasn't a single introduction, it was a small number of animal to human transmissions of very, very similar viruses. And they've also estimated that this occurred in November or early December. So we saw the first cases in mid-December, but this transmission could have probably occurred before that. Right. So the virus is now in the human population, and it is now clear that um, it can also spread from human to human since the majority of new cases that, people, that have been recorded have no history of exposure to the market that was suspected to be the source of the, of the virus. Um, and there have also been cases of healthcare workers caring for patients with the virus who have contracted the infection. Okay, so how does it spread from human to human? So it's spreading between people now, how does it spread? Now, the mechanism by which this particular virus spread, spreads has, um, has not been confirmed. We also don't know how easily it's transmitted. Um, however, we assume that it spreads like other respiratory viruses to which it is related. Um, and that would be either directly through the air and to someone in close proximity, um, when an infected person coughs or sneezes, or it might be via um, contact with objects or parts of an infected person's body that have been in contact with respiratory droplets, saliva, or nasal secretions. For example, somebody might sneeze on their hand and then touch a surface, and then when somebody else comes and touches that same surface, they pick up the virus and then they touch their face and they, um, they can become infected. Um, not to their skin on their face, but it might get into their nose or their mouth or their eyes. Um, there are some respiratory viruses which can be airborne and, but, uh, and then inhaled, but it's much more difficult to measure um, how much transmission happens this way. It's important to no note though that viruses vary in terms of how easily they spread from person to person. Um, they, they, they vary in how long they remain infectious once they're in, um, in, in the air, also how long they remain um, viable when they're on a surface. And some viruses are highly contagious, like measles is extremely contagious, others are less so. Um, spread of um, SARS and MERS between people has generally occurred between close contacts. Um, okay, so next question is, are there any specific medications that can be used to either prevent or treat the new coronavirus? Um, at this point, there are no specific treatments that are currently available, but treatments, so treatment really focuses on alleviating symptoms. Um, for severe cases, the treatment usually would in, involve care that um, helps to support vital organ function. 
Um, now, despite there not being any um, specific treatments available right now, the pace of research is extremely fast. And this is due to the very open sharing of data, both from, um, from China and from other um, countries. Um, researchers have been able to work very fast. And they've, they're already testing existing pneumonia treatments, antivirals and antibodies are being studied and tested. Um, Chinese researchers, as I said, they immediately released the sequence of the virus genome. And when, they, and when the, the researchers got that, they were able to start looking at um, possible vaccines and, and drugs that might intervene, um, uh, um, stop this virus. And in, there's, there's several institutions and organizations working on creating vaccines. So there's nothing to, to you, you can be supported in hospital, so you can be, you can be um, to alleviate symptoms and to, to support um, organ function and to ensure that you, um, not ensure, but to, to limit the risk of, um, of, of death or um, severe manifestations. Uh, in the meantime, how can you reduce the risk to yourself and to others? Well, the, the, as I said, we don't know exact everything about this virus yet, but we do know that it's a respiratory virus. We know viruses that are from the same family that it belongs to. So the advice that is being given out is really advice about reducing um, your risk to yourself from a respiratory virus. And this would involve frequent cleaning of your hands using alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water. Is when you're coughing or sneezing, you cover your nose and mouth, um, not with your hand, but with a flexed elbow or tissue, and you throw the tissue away properly immediately after and wash your hands. Um, avoid close contact with anyone who has fever or a cough. Um, if you have fever, cough, or difficulty breathing, you should seek medical care, medical care early and share your previous travel history with your healthcare provider. Um, now, this is not so applicable in Trinidad, but when visiting live markets in areas that are currently experiencing cases of novel coronaviruses, so this would apply to like China, um, you avoid unprotected contact with live animals and surfaces in contact with animals. And also in areas where the, um, there's a chance of the, uh, of the cross-species transmission, the consumption of raw undercooked animal products should be avoided. Right, so the last thing I want to address is another question that comes up all the time, which is why are these outbreaks happening so often? This is again fodder for conspiracy theorists. Um, now, there are various factors that can cause a virus to emerge. So a virus that is um, either unknown or restricted to a particular area spreading much more widely um, into new populations. What causes that? So there are various factors. You could have, for example, evolutionary changes in the virus, so the infectious agent, agent that affect the host that it can infect, the types of animals it can infect. It might affect how um, virulent it is, um, how easily it's transmitted, or it might confer drug resistance. Um, so, that, that, so it could be, the, 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 the reason could be because the virus itself or the pathogen itself has changed. Alternatively, it could be the host population that's changed. So you could have changes in a host population susceptibility. So for example, when you have immunodeficiency um, because of HIV um, infection, you can get emergence of diseases that weren't a problem before. Um, for example, tuberculosis is, tuberculosis is one of those things. Um, malnutrition, um, if, if somebody is, not, is malnourished and a uh, population is malnourished and they can't produce the right, um, um, enough proteins to make proper antibodies, again, diseases can emerge. And also we know about re reduced vaccine coverage. We have incidences of, of, of measles um, emerging because um, vaccine co coverage is not what it should be. However, the majority of disease emergence that we're seeing is thought to be linked to ecological changes that increase the probability of a susceptible person or susceptible populations being exposed to an infectious agent. And so that's what accounts for the majority. And as usual, it is our fault because um, it is the majority of disease emergence is driven by ecological factors associated with human activity. So for example, um, deforestation and habitat destruction, um, 
brings um put, puts humans in closer proximity to animals causes animals to move towards where humans are and so you get uh, more chances for interaction between different species um, we have very dense um, populations um, we have unplanned urbanization so people are in close proximity without proper um, infrastructure we also have the issue of climate change and there are also agricultural practices that set up conditions that are ideal for fostering these cross-species um, transmissions. Um, the, the global transport, this just means that um, it, it long ago, 100 years ago, if an outbreak of this same virus occurred in China, it may have been restricted to one area because people are not moving um, very far, okay? But now it can spread around the whole globe. So just to end up, the end, um, tackling this type of um, thing is not an easy task, as any environmental activist will tell you. But the solution at the end of the day is really to take care of our planet and to invest in, if I, I believe, to invest in infectious disease research and research that allows us to understand the relationship between humans, animals, and the environment. That's a whole area referred to as One Health. And um, I'll end there. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to invite Professor Clive Landis to make his presentation. Thank you very much, uh, PVC Bernal. Um, my name is uh, Professor Clive Landis. Uh, I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Studies. Uh, I'm probably sitting on this panel because um, uh, I was the chair of the Zika task um, the last time that we had a, a global uh, health e epidemic affecting our region. So it really doesn't seem that long ago um, that we were sitting in this position uh, faced with a very worrying uh, outbreak of a new virus, um, of course, the Zika virus. And in the last 10 years, if we just cast our minds back here in the Caribbean, we have had the H1N1 so-called swine flu virus of 2009. Then we had the chikungunya uh, virus in 2013. We had the Zika virus in 2016. In between, in 2014, we had a lucky uh, escape from the Ebola virus. Um, so, and here we are now uh, faced with a new virus, uh, the 2019 um, uh, coronavirus. And what I will say to everyone watching uh, live um, uh, online is that we will get over this. We have been here before and we will get over this. We are a very resilient people in the Caribbean. and. Our university is now playing an increasing role in helping to uh, work with our stakeholders in the region and with our communities to address these kind of health emergencies. So you would have known that uh, in case of uh, certain um, uh, environmental disasters, we have already had a system going for quite a long time um, uh, for hurricane uh, relief. Uh, after a, um, a hurricane. So, you know, whether it was um, uh, Hurricane Erica or Irma, Maria, Dorian, you know that the university is always straight in there, you know, with its engineers, uh, with its uh, counselors, uh, with the development specialists to help put the country back on its feet. And so we have now developed um, a system, and this really came into being with the uh, Zika epidemic, where the university. Um, has a system in place where we can work with the public health the agencies um, and with the communities to address these kind of um, health emergencies. And one of the most important parts of that mission is to provide reliable, trusted information. Because really, in truth, we're dealing with two outbreaks. We're dealing with an, a viral outbreak, which in itself is bad enough, but we're also dealing with an outbreak of misinformation. And, and you know, this varies from uh, the conspiracy theories. It, it makes people very worried. And, you know, where do you turn? I mean, there are some estimates that there's more fake news 
um, that comes out, then there is actually real news. So you can always trust the University of the West Indies to provide you with accurate information. So when there's an outbreak, look for us and, uh, and look for our kind of forums that we're putting on uh, as a matter of routine now when we're faced with these kind of health epidemics. And we will be faced with them over and over. So what you will see in this program is that we've taken the um, paradigm of the Zika epidemic, which is that we coordinate with countries in the region and we coordinate with the regional bodies. So this coordination will uh, uh, go ahead in the days um, uh, if the epidemic is eventually declared as a public health emergency um, of international concern, it hasn't been as yet, and then it will deepen. But we felt, um, based on advice from the Caribbean um, Public Health Agency, that we actually needed to have this forum immediately. And it was mostly to put accurate information into the public domain. And so when you look at this panel, we are speaking with one voice with the Caribbean Public Health Agency. And we have um, a chief medical officer representing uh, his country as well. We speak with one voice on these matters, and that's very, very important. And what uh, you will also see is that the university will um, give its capacity where it has capacity to countries when it is asked. So this was particularly evident in the Zika epidemic when, for example, in Jamaica, um, and our next speaker will be from the microbiology lab of the hospital, where we put the capacity of the laboratory at the, um, uh, uh, at the uh, service of the country and um, Zika tests were carried out by that laboratory. And I have no doubt that that, that laboratory, as soon as the primers are available for the, um, uh, to them for the coronavirus, that they will put that laboratory at the service of the country as they did before. And I want to just um, end uh, with the importance of building laboratory capacity in the region to handle these kind of outbreaks because when you um, have an outbreak, uh, we, decades ago, we would have had very limited capacity to do any kind of viral um, uh, detection. So the uh, famous um, HIV epidemic actually has given the Caribbean quite a strong capacity now for measuring viruses. So the same labs that um, uh, were often set up and developed to uh, combat HIV, they're now being put towards detection of um, influenza, seasonal influenza, pandemic influenza, bird flu, um, any number of viruses of concern, um, uh, including human papilloma virus, the causative agent of um, cervical cancer. So our viral detection capacity has increased and with every epidemic and with more coordination, it gets stronger. And it's important that we build our own indigenous capacity to, to carry out um, uh, laboratory testing, because that's what's needed, particularly in a fast moving epidemic. So let's say you have a visitor at the airport or in the community who is showing some symptoms. You need to be able to identify this person as quickly as possible. Do they have the virus of concern or not? Can you eliminate them or do they need to be put into quarantine? Um, and we need to have that answer quite quickly. And so uh, in the past, um, sometimes our viral detection capacity has been quite limited and we've had to send viruses off to a referral service um, uh, made available to us through partners. And that time lag and also the, the, the minimum number of samples that we're permitted to send makes it difficult to uh, get on top of an epidemic and to give accurate information and to build that element of trust um, uh, that's needed it's the cornerstone of the public health response. So I really do want to um, uh, indicate that building our own indigenous laboratory capacity is very, very important. And uh, uh, I do chair a, um, a Caribbean uh, a professional society called the uh, Caribbean Cytometry and Analytical Society. And we published a paper showing that if you take the long time span of 10 years, 
you can show that the Caribbean is gradually building more and more and more capacity, particularly to detect viruses. So we're not sort of uh, completely where we would like to be, but, but we're moving in the right direction. And uh, uh, I think um, uh, uh, this will really help to underpin uh, our responses uh, going forwards. So uh, I think I will stop there because uh, that really gives a very nice um, segue into um, the next uh, speaker. I'm hoping it's John, if he's available, or Sandra, uh, on the laboratory um, component uh, to the public health response. But thank you very much. Um, uh, and as I said before, we will get over this. Thank you, Professor Landis. I'm now going to, in the absence of Dr. John Lindo, I'm going to ask Dr. Sandra Jackson, Department of Microbiology, to come and enlighten us from the podium. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me here. We would like to go back and reflect on the role that the laboratory has played uh, over the years. And as has been mentioned, uh, Jamaica has previously been exposed to various outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics, and we have managed to cope with them um, adequately. Following on the 1918 pandemic, influenza pandemic, which most persons are familiar with, which killed an approximately 50 million persons worldwide over an eight to nine month period, what most persons fail to remember is within the Caribbean region, Jamaica, Guyana, and Barbados were among the first countries to be affected during the 1918 pandemic. And among the three countries only, we had over 10,000 deaths. Today, travel is not what it was in the days of 1918. And you know that just looking at the situation in, in China and the imported cases now that are occurring in the United States, Canada, and in other countries outside, we see that travel is playing a very important role. And within the Caribbean community, within our region, we not only have to uh, recall and take note of the present population within the Caribbean, but we also have to look at the dynamics of population transmission. And at any one time, with, within a, with, a six-month period, if you calculate and you add it up, we have approximately an average about 40 million persons resident and in exchange between the cruise ships, airlines, etc. So being prepared and having a proper strategy in place and being able to detect the viruses that arrive here early um, is important and the university will continue to play a role in the early detection of such viruses. Let us move forward to the 2009 outbreak. In the 2009 pandemic, uh, which was a very mild pandemic, and just to clarify, when WHO will declare a pandemic, it's because really of it's because of the number of countries that are being affected within a certain period of time. So if the virus spreads rapidly and is affecting a, um, a significant number of countries, this is when WHO will take the call. So there are several, but there are other factors as well that will come into play. So we have to be patient as the experts at WHO deliberate to say, okay, when they will make the call and if they will make the call. In the meanwhile, when we go back to reference to hurricanes and hurricane preparedness, we may say, what does hurricanes have to do with pandemics, with viruses, etc.? And when I heard that analogy that at first, I, want, I really was not too convinced with it, but it does. Because just as with hurricanes in Jamaica and within the other regions, we have a systematic approach. You know something is coming, you prepare. We have to adapt that kind of approach to emerging infectious diseases as well and be prepared for when they arrive on our shores. In May, 2000, in May 2009, we had the first case, imported case 
of H1N1 into Jamaica. And this actually was a traveler who went to New York and who had returned. And then previously, it was in April, only in April, a couple of weeks prior to that, that a few cases had been occurring in the United States and in Mexico. So this is just to show you again and refer back to the population dynamics and the role of the laboratory. The university at that time had been preparing for uh, emerging diseases and ability to detect. And we were able to detect the first case that came into Jamaica and collaborate with the Ministry of Health to have the Ministry of Health play their role in contact tracing to minimize the morbidity and mortality associated with that pandemic. So when we come forward to where we are now, Following the 1918 outbreak, and there have been several other pandemics since then, all of which have affected Jamaica, what has happened is that Jamaica, in conjunction with other national, international public health agencies, such as the Pan American Health Organization and the World Health Organization and CARFA, um, we have here at the university the National Influenza Center, which deals specifically with uh, respiratory viruses, influenza, and also, as was mentioned, we now play a critical role also in the detection of Zika, uh, Dengue, uh, Chikungunya, and other emerging viruses. As such, because this is so, the National Influenza Center, and this is something that the Caribbean region should be proud of, was established in 1948 through Professor Grant. And so it does have some history to it, and we have been trying to uh, keep a pace with the advancing technologies. And um, with the advent of this new coronavirus, which when I say new, it is actually new, not like with the influenza virus that has various subtypes and circulate on a regular basis in the population. Therefore, there may be some persons who have already been exposed to some subtypes of the influenza viruses. So when there is a slight variation in the influenza virus that comes in, yes, we will have an increased number of persons who may present uh, with, with infections, and sometimes it may be a little bit more severe, but the population in general in Jamaica does have some immunity to the usual circulating influenza viruses. With this coronavirus, we don't have any immunity. So having everything put in place, following the necessary preventative measures is critical and crucial for the control, early detection, control and prevention of excessive morbidity that may come should this virus be introduced into Jamaica. The, w, the National Influenza, to give you a little bit of background, works in conjunction with the Pan American Health Organization and also the Pan American Health Organization with the World Health Organization, reporting on a weekly basis on the circulating influenza viruses. So what about the other viruses now, such as the coronavirus? Fortunately, we are still a part of that international community and WHO and PAHO have already contacted and communicated with the National Influenza Center. There are, there's a new assay, okay, that uh, will be, that is being developed. I think it's, it's, it's almost ready now and that will be distributed to all National Influenza Centers of which Jamaica is one. So we do intend to have, uh, be able to detect the virus here. What do we do in the meantime, in the meanwhile, in that interim gap? There, although there are some newer, some companies announcing that they do have assays, just as in Wuhan in China, they do have assays that were able to detect this new coronavirus. So access to these primer probes and con um, commercial um, kits, although they're not FDA approved, that is one alternative. But what WHO has also done is established coronavirus reference laboratories, just as how there are influenza reference laboratories, and different regions and countries within the region have uh, access to a shipping fund so they are able to, should such a case arise, actually send such a specimen to the representative um, coronavirus um, laboratory. 
We do have the technical expertise within the Department of Microbiology. And in terms of the infrastructure there, we have been working on it to upgrade the infrastructure so that there is better containment should we have highly merged viruses there so that we not only protect the outside community, but the, also that we do protect the staff because we have to put our staff foremost um, in protecting. And training, ongoing training is taking place. The Department of Microbiology has, uh, within the past, prior to uh, the increase, the exponential increase in the number of cases of the coronavirus, actually, been involved with collaborations with other departments within the hospital and done some, uh, given some presentations with regards to what should happen if the coronavirus has evolved. So they have started actually sharing such information and they are open to continue sharing information with the rest of the community. So uh, with that, I will close. It's a very short presentation. And um, if there are any other questions, I'm sure that Mr. Chair will. Thank you. Thank you. I know you volunteered at very short notice, um, and I hope you'll be able to stay with us for the Q&A. I would now like to invite Dr. Joy St. John, Executive Director of the Caribbean Medical, of the Caribbean Public Health Agency to address us. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm hoping that you can both hear and see me. I want to thank the University of the West Indies for inviting CARFA to this meeting. And I'm going to give you a situation update on the novel coronavirus and COV. First, a little outline of what we will be doing. And on the right, you can see a map of what has been happening in China. So I'm going to give you an idea of the current situation, global actions to date, enhanced surveillance measures, a laboratory update, clinical management. Well, I may shorten that based on the presentation of the virologists. Current port health guidance for the Caribbean, CARFA's response, the risk to the region, CARFA's role in any response to this, some interesting communications that have been circulation, circulating, the fake news, and some key messages to end it all. So people are terrified by the real and fake news circulating on social media, and CARFA along with its partners, including the University of the West Indies, can bring clarity and a voice of reason. As was stated earlier, the outbreak of novel coronavirus um, caused severe acute respiratory illness reported first in Wuhan in December. The virus has not been previously identified. I emphasize that because part of the fake news is saying that this is an old virus and nothing um, that is unknown. And but little is known about the virus and this is of concern. So the objectives of the public health response are to in interrupt the transmission of the virus from one person to another in China. What we currently know, as was stated before, the virus belongs to the same family of coronaviruses as SARS. Cases have presented with viral pneumonia of unknown etiology, which is now known as novel coronavirus infected pneumonia. The initial investigation of cases in Wuhan revealed most patients had severe and non-productive cough following the onset of illness. Some had difficulty breathing, and almost all had normal or decreased white cell counts and X-ray evidence of pneumonia. The outbreak in Wuhan was initially linked to 
a market which has now been closed. The possible zoonotic origin to the outbreak is being suggested by CDC. WHO has confirmed that based on reports, person-to-person -person transmission is taking place within communities in China. We have also had person-to-person -person transmission just announced uh, by CDC in Illinois in the US between um, closely linked persons. Some sources have suggested that people without symptoms appear to be transmitting the illness. And I'm hoping that WHO can give us more information on that because this of course makes uh, things quite different. But we still have so much more to learn about this novel virus, about how it spreads, about the severity of associated illness and other features of the virus. And so I'm going to spend just a minute or two to give you an idea of the range of countries that have reported uh, up until now, have reported uh, importations, but we now know that Apart from China, mainland China, we have a case of person-to-person -person transmission in the U.S. just announced. What have been the global actions to date? WHO sent directives to hospitals around the world on infection and the prevention and control thereof. There has been updated advice for international traffic in relation to novel coronavirus. And I'm giving you some links here. The global threat level was raised to high by WHO on the 27th of January, 2020. The emergency committee, when last convened on 23rd January, declined to declare the current situation of public health emergency of international concern. It has been reconvened now and that I keep checking to see if we've had any announcement from WHO. Updates will be provided as soon as we know. We are all very interested. But the response from China has been quite extreme. Chinese authorities have imposed travel bans in the affected province. And yesterday, they even curtailed the use of private vehicles cannot drive in cars. And all of this is to limit the spread within mainland China. Airport authorities in the United States, as well as most Asian nations, including Japan, Thailand, Singapore, and South Korea, have stepped up temperature screening of passengers. Uh, when I spoke about the issue of the possibility of transmitting virus before being symptomatic, the yield for temperature screening is normally low, one in 10 of persons who could have um, an illness could be picked up by temperature screening. But if there is no expression, um, uh, if there is transmission while asymptomatic, the yield would be even worse. And guidance has been given on entry and exit screening. Some airlines have even started canceling flights to and from China. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, commonly known as CDC, established their incident management system to coordinate a domestic and international public health response. On January 23rd, CDC updated the Level 2 Travel Health Notice for Wuhan and is advising travelers that preliminary information suggests that older adults with underlying health conditions maybe at increased risk for severe disease. And from the perspective of the Caribbean situation with our burden of chronic diseases, this is something that we have noted in our understanding of what can be recommended for the health service response at the different stages of the outbreak. They also issued a level two alert for the rest of China and CDC is taking proactive preparedness precautions. This whole issue of enhanced surveillance, there's interim guidance on which person should be investigated as they um, 
travel from the affected areas. A laboratory update, WHO has posted two protocols for the direction, sorry, detection of the novel coronavirus. And member states are recommended to follow the guidelines and ask the CAR for Medical Microbiology Laboratory for advice as a reference laboratory for the Caribbean. CARFA has procured um, for the confirmatory test necessary primers, etc. So we will commence testing as necessary once it fits the case definition next week. We have also commenced procurement of a screening test, which is a rapid test, which will be available in, within a matter of hours. And we should be able to start testing on that within the next 10 days to two weeks. The CARFA Medical Microbiology Laboratory in Trinidad and Tobago is working with CAHO on the development of that local laboratory capacity, which was just discussed as being very important. Um, and CARFA's Medical Microbiology Laboratory will follow the international recommendation of sending well-screened and characterized samples to one of the WHO collaborative centers in the region. Currently, we are looking at CDC and Public Health Agency of Canada. These are some clinical features and epidemiological links that in the interest of time, I will not go into in great detail. So WHO has developed interim protocols for the clinical management of novel coronavirus. And these are links are here on the screen. We will leave this presentation for dissemination by the University of the West Indies. For, for testing, um, there are certain clinical features plus epidemiological risks that will indicate if tests should be done. So what I am showing you is one of the memes that has been circulating about this very unfortunate outbreak. And it's a plane with a mask all around the world Unfortunately, even in the Caribbean, some people feel more protected because they have a mask. And so this is taking it to the extreme to show that even the planes are using masks. But now I'm going to give you the true and serious guidance for ports of entry that CARFA have developed as outlined in the international health regulations, countries should ensure that routine measures are in place for the identification of suspected cases, infection prevention and control procedures, and also the whole issue of the donning and doffing of PPE. And all of this goes towards the protection of the, of the healthcare workers to limit the spread of the virus. There should be appropriate space and stockpile of adequate equipment in place for assessing and managing ill travelers detected before travel, on board a vessel, and on arrival at points of entry. So we're talking not just about reports that people know about, but other crossings, either at the border or um, at unmanned points of entry. There should be clear lines of communication between departments and with the public. Safe means of transportation of symptomatic travelers to designated facilities should also be in place. And a function, functional public health emergency contingency plan should be in place at points of entry. So what you see now, bear with me. What you see now, is the outline of CARFA's response. CARFA activated its incident management team and is coordinating the regional health preparedness and response. We issued two situation reports to CARFA member states, and these have also been shared with our CARICOM partner, SIDEMA, CARICOM headquarters, the Caribbean Tourism Organization, the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association and other regional stakeholders. 
We develop travelers guidelines which have been shared again with our partners in tourism, as well as our CARICOM partners, and very, very most importantly, the CARFA member states. We're currently developing air and seaport guidelines for dissemination. We issued two press releases and shared with our stakeholders. Last week, when I was in London, I met with Professor Ferguson of the Imperial College of London, who has been modeling the spread of the virus for WHO, so could I, I could get an understanding of the issues. I also was privileged to meet with Public Health England and the Public Health Authorities of the Netherlands and France to discuss preparedness and response. We have been coordinating with the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Association, Association and two days ago, SEDEMA, in association with CARFA, convened a joint briefing of the National Disaster Coordinators because, as you can see, what has been happening in Wuhan, this is not just a health response. And the National Disaster Coordinators can convene the other key players initially in the ports, immigration, customs, police, etc. And then if there is importation or if there's person-to-person -person transmission in the Caribbean, the other key players to ensure that uh, governance and, and public activities are coordinated. And this is also dependent on the severity of the virus. We are anxious to hear the, the kind of profile, the clinical profile that we would need to expect if it's more to the mild side, moderate or severe disease that we need to prepare for. And we convene the Regional Coordinating Mechanism for Health Security, which is a mandate of the heads of government of CARICOM. We convene this with member states and our partners, both in CARICOM and the international partners that I have been speaking about uh, including PAHO and CDC. And we discuss the whole issue of uh, risk and threat. Uh, a risk assessment was, was presented and discussed and how we will go about supporting uh, member states as this outbreak evolves. So the response of CARFA has been the monitoring of the international situation as it evolves. Working with the CARFA member states, uh, Caribbean coordinating partners and mechanisms to respond to the threat and to prepare the member states to prevent further transmission from an exported case. Or if there is a trans an exported case and then person to person transmission, the rolling out of both the health response and other sectors response as the outbreak evolves. So what is the risk assessment that CARFA has given based on the risk assessment tool that I told you that was created and discussed with our partners? Currently, despite WHO giving a global uh, risk of high for the region of the Caribbean, it's currently low from the perspective of disease importation but vigilance is required. The situation is changing quite rapidly. One of the biggest risks to the region is the social media misinformation, which is a risk to the stable profile of the Caribbean. And one of the things we are working with our partners, CTO and CHTA to try to avoid is negatively affecting tourism because of a negative portrayal of the health response of the region. So CARFA's role is to support its member states in adapting existing influenza preparedness plans to adapt to the novel coronavirus, the training and refreshing of training of healthcare workers in universal precautions and the use of necessary personal protective equipment to ensure that our very important um, healthcare workers are protected and the implementation and supporting measures to protect the most vulnerable in our populations from developing disease and trying to avoid unnecessary death. 
So let me give you an idea of some of the myths and misinformation that have been circulating in the Caribbean and creating panic and some rather strange responses. And on the left, I wanted to show you an actual example and what these um, myth purveyors have done is that they found formats that look authentic and then they intersperse conspiracy theories, misinformation, fake news with some facts. So it looks credible and it increases the fear of persons. Prevention method is to keep your throat moist. That's do not hold your thirst. Till the end of March, do not go to crowded places, wear masks. So I understand that there, there are some countries where there have been runs on masks. Avoid fried or spicy food and load up with vitamin C. And the virus causing it is very potent and is resistant to existing antibiotics. So for persons who are not trained, who would understand that an antibiotic doesn't work against a virus in the first case, um, these kinds of things cause fear and strange behaviors. So the, the Care for Communications um, team has been actively working and engaging key stakeholders and providing them with accurate, relevant, and timely information through convening and participating in response coordination meetings with key st stakeholders, including the Regional Health Communication Network, which has focal points in all of our 26 member states, responding to the communication needs of CARFA member states by providing daily situation reports and sharing communication messages and materials to communication focal points via regular and social media, providing information knowledge that is relevant and easily accessible through the CARFA website, and providing technical support, including templates and guidelines for developing communications plans and strategies during a public health emergency or outbreak. So this is a hoax video that has been gaining quite a bit of traction. In the interest of time, I won't hit the link, but really it's a rather interesting video that I hope you can watch later. I hope you heard that CMO. And here is another joke to show you how extreme things are. The Corona bear is being shunned by the Heineken bear. But I, I found out that some people have actually started to believe that the bear is the cause of the novel coronavirus. The level of misinformation is, is off the charts. So here are some key messages to end my presentation. Currently, there is no case of novel coronavirus in the Caribbean. But CARFA recommends that member states be proactive and vigilant. One of the best protections is against proper, sorry, is to practice proper hand hygiene. And CARFA recommends that CARFA member states follow credible sites for guidance. Thank you. Thank you. Very reassuring that the risk assessment is low. I now want to invite the Chief Medical Officer of the Government of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Parasram, to join us. Good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Yes. Afternoon to everyone across the Caribbean. So, first of all, I just want to say thanks on behalf of Trinidad and Tobago that we allowed the opportunity to be on the panel this afternoon. Um, having to go last is a difficult thing, but there's usually very little to say. So I, I think I'll speak about our national response in Trinidad and Tobago to the virus itself. Um, and I'm sure my colleagues, CMOs across the region, would have similar responses in their respective countries. So beginning, of course, we, we look at credible sources. We look at the international um, information that is available to us looking to WHO, PAHO, CAFA, 
to get day-to-day -day or even hourly updates as the situation progresses throughout the world as a starting block to see how we would gauge our response. The, the key in the, in the early days of the epidemic was, of course, we have no cases, as Dr. St. John had said, in the Caribbean at this point. So, of course, we want to keep it that way. And our first point of contact is really to the port. So what we have done in the first instance is strengthen all our, our surveillance at the major ports of entry into Trinidad and Tobago. And we have done so utilizing um, enhanced surveillance, somewhat true term of scanning of, of certain flights, flights coming from Canada, from North America, Panama, because those are the countries that we would have seen persons emanating from the source coming into Trinidad and Tobago and the region as a whole. So in Trinidad, we have in our possession 18 thermal scanners. They are put at our major ports of entry. We have five fixed scanners, five handheld scanners at the port of, um, at the airport, Tr uh, Trinidad. There are three in Tobago and there are two fixed scanners there in Trinidad as well. Throughout the other ports, we have two or three dispersed throughout the country in our ports of Cedras. Uh, major ports of um, Point Lisas, as well as Port of Port of Spain. The other, the other parts as we go through, we had looked at training, as Dr. St. John again has indicated that she supports member states, training of physicians, training of healthcare workers to ensure that they know basically what the case definition is of the virus, because it is a novel coronavirus. Luckily, we have had experience with both SARS and MERS, in terms of the definitions, they are coronaviruses and they are similar in the way they present. They are similar in the way they are transmitted as far as we know at this point. Um, so we have been updating our standard operating procedures. We have been updating our training to physicians and trying to ensure that all, all our healthcare workers and frontline personnel are trained with enough, um, enough relevant material that they can react if need be. The, the issue of first PPE, um, personal protective equipment, it, there seems to be, and, and Dr. Sejan again alluded to the issue of having a short supply in certain areas. We have been getting difficulty to actually get a proper supply. We do have a supply uh, of a fair amount, but we have heard from some of our suppliers that their, their um, main suppliers in other parts of the world, US and otherwise, are now telling them that they have no supply available for us in the region which would have been pre-ordered a few months ago and they're now turning away and saying that they have no supply, it has been booked elsewhere. So we have to in, in turn turn to other suppliers and we have bought as, as much as up to 25,000 masks in the, over the last few days to ensure that we have adequate supply for our healthcare workers. The conduction of national drills continues. We would have been doing this uh, since I believe late last year to ensure that our personnel are well well equipped in terms of being able to don and doff your PPE, making sure that the procedures out of the port in the event that we get a suspected case as Jamaica would have had in a port or coming out of the primary care setting or even in secondary care setting. So we have been doing drills up to tomorrow midday. We have another drill which would include our major hospitals, um, Eric Williams and San Fernando, together with the port of Port of Spain and the International Airport at Trinidad. So we'll be doing those drills as we go. In terms of public education, everybody I think that has spoke before has spoken to the, the myths that have been going around. And I think to the population at large, we have been trying from the Ministry of Health Trinidad and Tobago to get as much information out there as possible, supported well by CAFA, to ensure that people know what, what, is the, what is the, are the truths of the virus as it progresses. Of course, it is new, and when something is new and little is known in certain areas, then someone has to fill the gaps and the myths have taken over to some extent. So I think part of the UE um, TV, this, this bulletin will address hopefully some of the myths that have been circulating around. The more information we have as a population, as even physicians, persons in the, in the sector, the more relevant, the more appropriate and the more accurate information, then we act in appropriate ways. So, in terms of this particular virus, as we said, MERS is a threat to Trinidad every year because we would have our members of our population going to those areas for Hajj. We would normally line this those people as they return. We would actually do 14 day surveillance by phone on them. So there's some degree of, of historic, in terms of coronavirus, Trinidad and Tobago has some, 
some um, experience with it itself, but it's, this is novel virus. And what I think is different for the novel virus is that the spread occurs in the incubation period. As far as I know, at this point, asymptomatic carriers are actually transmitting the virus. There's no specific treatment and there's no specific vaccine. And all factors combined makes it, from a public health perspective, very difficult to control and very difficult to treat. And it requires a coordinated event, um, coordinated response across the borders with CARPA, with PAHO, with WHO. And we look to WHO with Beated Bed to see if and when a public health emergency of international concern will be declared. Um, we, we monitor by the minute to see what is happening and take our guidance from there to the most part. But we have seen in Russia, there has been some restriction in, tra in, in travel in Hong Kong as well. Some of our airlines, for instance, British Airways, has stopped bringing persons from China into Trinidad. As far as I know, I'm waiting confirmation from the airport's authority. There's a condor flight out of Germany, which actually restricted some transport of Chinese nationals as well, which came into Tobago a couple of years ago. So on, on that um, front, I would just like to say, we stand in solidarity with our Caribbean neighbors. We are all looking to WHO, PAHO, CAFA for support and for technical guidance as we proceed. And I am certain that the Caribbean, as Professor Landis had said, would overcome this difficult time as we did in the past with other viruses of a similar nature. And thanks again for the opportunity for University of Diversity to be part of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. We're now open for questions. All the panelists have remained linked and will be available to us. Those people asking questions, we request that you identify yourself and your institution and uh, confine yourself to asking a specific question. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I have a question here from someone online who identifies themselves as a UWI graduate. The question is, panicking will happen, but not letting the public be aware is not right. How can we better equip ourselves in the event, and how will the meeting in Geneva help us at this time to prepare? Would any of the panelists like to address this question? So I can start, and I'm alerting my two colleagues, um, the assistant director, Dr. Indar, and um, consultant, Dr. Stephanie fletcher Lati to pitch in where I, I don't give issues. So the first thing is how can you protect yourself? And in the Caribbean right now with no case imported or without person to person spread, the best thing is just this first and simple thing, good hand hygiene. If you are coughing and sneezing, you wouldn't necessarily go and cough and sneeze in a person's face keep up that habit so that if there is any importation or if there is person to person spread, you're already practicing good habits. Wash your hands frequently. It is suggested that this may be spreading not only through the respiratory route, but also fecal oral. So when you use the bathroom, wash your hands. The other thing about the um, announcement in, in Geneva we're all waiting with bated breath. Our team, well, I'm saying back in Trinidad and Tobago, because I'm in Vienna right now, Vienna, Austria. But our team in Trinidad and Tobago is monitoring the outcome of that. I do not want to preempt what could happen. But in any case, even if there is a declaration, the way in which the health services are preparing 
the way in which we have uh, structured our threat level and the activities that will commence, including communications, depending on what stage of the outbreak the Caribbean is, is on. It is important to follow the guidance that we will distill for you, so it's Caribbean specific. Um, Dr. Indar, I'm going to mute my mic if you want to pitch in here. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, just to indicate, uh, the WHO has just declared it a uh, public health uh, emergency of international concern. Just read it. Right. So we will update as we go along. But as Dr. St. John C said, the biggest thing in terms of prevention is having um, is hand hygiene. It's important to be vigilant. A lot of questions are being asked. Part of the whole tracing and investigation is to ensure that uh, only if you are in contact with someone who have been infected, then you are likely to then transmit. So this is where that first part of screening comes in. Um, but we urge all public the same thing on our travelers guidelines to uh, practice good hygiene, uh, to be vigilant um, in terms of uh, how they care about themselves, um, not just hand hygiene, but ge general um, social um, interactions if that, if there is any form of possible transmission to the Caribbean. We still do not have any reported uh, confirmed case in the region and we will work very hard and hope that does not happen. CAFA has issued guidelines, um, an algorithm, um, which is the WHO algor algorithm and how do you treat a suspected case? Um, and CAFA has issued travelers guidelines and port of entry travelers, um, port of entry guidelines that you can look at. Over. Permit me if possible, uh, just by happenstance, I will be going to Geneva tomorrow to attend the executive board meetings. So what I will endeavor to do is to keep uh, the CARFA team and by extension, the, the CARFA member states uh, fully apprised of how things are unfolding at WHO. Thank you. Could you elaborate on exactly what the World Health Organization declaration means? A public health emergency of international concern means that the health authorities have gotten a signal from WHO that they should reassess the, the local situation and put any additional measures other than the preparedness measures that are in place. The other issues should be put in place. One of the things that Tedros said um, was that in the declaration of a public health emergency of international concern, he was by no means giving a vote of no confidence to China. Because as was said earlier, I think by your virologist, China has been sharing a lot of information and has been going to extreme measures to contain this outbreak. But he said that he just wants the world to be ready and support China as well. He is still not recommending any restriction on trade or travel. And CARFA will continue not to recommend restrictions on trade and travel. CARFA recommends each country is sovereign or if they're overseas territories, they're guided by the public health authorities of their mother countries. And each country that therefore interprets what they do. But the issue of restriction and trade of trade and travel in a region that is heavily tourism dependent is one which needs careful thought. If there is restriction on travel from China, if person to person transmission 
is established in the US and the UK, our country is also going to restrict travel from our main tourism destinations. So these are some of the things that CARFA has been trying to think ahead, knowing that uh, there are political issues and issues of, of keeping your populations um, calm that predicate some actions that may not have been recommended. And so this is why we have been working with Sidema to ensure that there is, is an intelligent interpretation of how things should unfold in the Caribbean, given our uh, need for tourism and also given our need to protect the public health. Uh, I think I'll pause here because I suspect there will be many other questions. Yes. I'm concerned that among our preventative measures, especially for um, children, are hand sanitizers a part of this good hand health? Are they helpful at all in this situation, hand sanitizers? Stephanie, take that one. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Stephanie Fletcher-Larty. So hand sanitizers should be used in the absence of soap and water. So if the child does not have access to soap and water to wash their hands, then we recommend that they use the hand sanitizers. It's a good way to start teaching them hand hygiene and to follow up with the hand washing if, if water is not available immediately. Thank you. Another question? A question from a UWI colleague. They are asking whether wearing a surgical mask during airline travel is beneficial. Lisa, take that. <laughs> so this is a this is a question that's being asked in many different places. So it depends on where the travel is coming from. We are advising at the moment, travelers that are coming to the Caribbean, the risk is low because if you're coming directly from China, the chances are, well, there are no direct flights to the Caribbean from China. Let's start with that. If you're coming to the Caribbean, the likelihood is that you would then be screened at that first point of entry, which is either UK, US, or Canada. So that's the first thing. Persons then who are symptomatic will then be isolated for two weeks. Persons that are asymptomatic would then do obviously um, they they would they, they would be asked to quarantine themselves for ten to fourteen days to ensure that they, that no signs of illness are, or symptoms are occurring. So the likelihood then of someone then coming on then from the second port of entry to us is still low at the moment. So if you use the science, then having then the wearing of mask is, you know, um, would not then be recommended at this time. Can I just pitch in to say that a surgical mask does get wet by nasal and mouth secretions. And once you have it wet, there is really no protection. It's more a psychological thing than anything. But if you are ill, you are having to go out to seek attention. Wearing that mask is a way of, of trying to curtail on transmission to persons who are around you if you're in a public space um, traveling. So there are occasions when a surgical masks are in order, but to go out and start buying surgical masks, especially in the Caribbean, where there is no case and no person-to-person -person transmission, that is not something that CARFA will recommend. Should Carnival in Trinidad and Tobago be canceled or postponed? given the heavy travel traffic and potential transmission. And this is to, of course, to mitigate risk. 
Dr. Paris Ram, before you come in, let me say something that uh, CARF is doing for the entire region, and it is not just for um, Trinidad and Tobago. We have activated uh, our partners in the security cluster. CARF is part of the security cluster of CARICOM, and we have uh, been having them track persons who are coming from China, even though they're not direct flights, they can track persons who go through other locations. So um, from the immediate perspective, the risk of persons sneaking through um, from China are low in the Caribbean. However, if we start having person-to-person -person transmission established in other Des, um, countries that will come to, to Carnival, uh, we will let Dr. Paris Ram deal with that. Hello. Well, I, I think um, the minister would have publicly said that, that can, at, at least a day or two ago, can, we were not considering cancelling or postponing Carnival. It's a decision that will have to be made to cabinet um, by the cabinet of the country, if and when that needs to be done. Um, and again, what Dr. St. John has said is that the risk at this point is very low. Most of the people that come to Carnival in the territory would be from North America, from Canada, from those areas. So we don't anticipate there should be an escalation in the risk. And we think that the surveillance activities that are occurring in and out of the port are enough at this point not to do so today. Having said that, in the future, as the disease progresses, if there's person to person to spread in, in other territories, it, of course, having a gathering of that nature is a, is a great public health risk to anyone. Um, so I think consideration can be given to, to it in the future if the need arises. But at this point, I think um, it is not necessary. And again, I can't make that decision for Trinidad and Tobago. It has to be made by cabinet with justification. Thank if you. If the chair will permit. Yes, I will permit. If the chair will permit, I will recount some measures that were put in place um, when the country that I used to be the chief medical officer had a, a public gathering. It's true, it's not as large as, as Carnival, but there are measures that were put in place. We did sessions, uh, the public health staff that is. We did sessions with band leaders and spoke about the things that would reduce um, spread. At that time, it was quite different from what is going on now. There is no imported case in Trinidad. There is no established person-to-person -person transmission of the novel coronavirus. Dr. Paris Ram, don't forget that. So, at the time, the country that I was chief medical officer, there was um, this threat as well. And the issues of um, how they jump and wave and what they wave and all of that, all of those things were discussed with um, the band member, the band leaders to try to curtail the issue of any spread from persons who may have been ill and imported it. But at that time, the sophistication of detection, um, the tracking of persons from countries of concern or areas of concern, those things were not in place. And, the, and my country had the, um, the festival and there was no spread of um, H1N1 at the time. So uh, CARFA will support Trinidad and Tobago as it as it needs in either decision making or anything else. Um, so I can tell you there are countries that did it and they were fine. Uh, one of the concerns that exist is that, or one of the fears that exists is that persons feel as though they are not able to do much. Their options to prevent spread to themselves and to other persons is limited. And so one of the questions I hear emerging is, are there any nutritional steps that persons can take to help to build immunity 
or to help to lessen the severity. I know this is another virus, but based on our experience with other coronaviruses, is there ev any evidence to suggest that any kind of supplementation or other nutritional steps, say with zinc or vitamin D, can actually play a role in lessening the severity of the disease? Stephanie? So, uh, step in because um, someone said the word Im immune system and uh, I'm an immunologist. Chair, would you permit me? Yes, please, Professor. Okay, so it's important to note that the immune system, it acts uh, almost like a weather vane for the health of your body as a whole. So yes, nutrition is extremely important. Um, if you're poorly nourished, um, you have a poor diet, your immune system is not going to be as strong as someone who has a very a good balanced diet, which includes the helpings of fruit and vegetables, uh, which are recommended. So, so yes, nutrition is important for the overall health of your immune system. Um, but there is very little evidence for being able to ward off infectious disease agents by loading up on additional uh, vitamins beyond what is recommended in the five helpings of fruit and vegetables. Um, the nearest that you can get to solid evidence is that normal influenzas, uh, if you have a combination of high dose vitamin C and zinc, can at best decrease the, uh, time, the length of uh, the infection by about one day out of the usual seven to ten days that you're infected. So really there's very little evidence that changing anything above and beyond what is needed for a healthy body and a healthy mind um, is needed. And I do include healthy mind. If you are continually stressed out about the threats to you from this virus and you start consuming all of this uh, news that's circulating on social media, you will actually impact your immune system. It will raise levels of cortisol, it will raise levels uh, in the ACTH axis, the um, hypothalamic pituitary axis, and you can diminish your immunity through um, uh, getting overly agitated. So, so, so you know, I, I ask you to um, be of good spirit and mind and body, and that will um, help ward off all um, illnesses to a certain extent, uh, just by having a good, healthy immune system. Thank you. Are there other questions? Okay, well, if not, we'll actually, we have. If not, we have come to the close of this forum at exactly three o'clock as we planned. Um, I want on your behalf to thank the Vice Chancellor who initiated this forum on very short notice. I want to especially express my appreciation to all of those who took part today, who all responded uh, very quickly and had to adjust their schedules. Let me recognize Professor Christine Carrington, Professor Clive Landis, uh, Dr. Joy St. John, Dr. Parasram, and Dr. Spence, especially who only got the notice late this afternoon. It was a most informative uh, exchange. The university is always there whenever the Caribbean region needs its expertise and policy recommendation. I, for one, am very reassured. I'm much more informed, and uh, I feel much more reassured that the region's capability has been mobilized and that there is considerable expertise and experience in the region. And we at the University of the West Indies are working very closely with our national governments and with the Caribbean Public Health Agency. We are happy to know that at this time the assessment is that the risk is low, 
We hope that remains so. And uh, we thank you for attending. And we thank UWI TV for allowing this to go across the region and to allow participation. They have been laboring from yesterday this time. They have been, I hope you all went home at some stage, but uh, for the last 24 hours. And not in vain, shall I say that, because we did see everybody and hear everybody. So once again, thank you very much for attending. And we hope that the situation will be such that we don't have to repeat this seminar for any more serious developments. Thank you.